sometimes there's, there's an overriding effect of this because when you take growth hormone, growth hormone makes your body convert more T4 to T3. So sometimes if you go for blood work with, when you're on growth hormone, you'll notice you have high T3 levels or high normal sometimes, and then your T4 levels are a little on the lower side. And people think, sometimes doctors don't understand this. They're like, oh, your thyroid gland isn't producing enough T4. Well, it is, I mean, T, yeah, it is. It's just you're converting more to T3 because of GH. <laughs> I created Species Nutrition with one mission in mind, to provide bodybuilders and serious athletes with no-nonsense supplements that work. I put my name and reputation on every bottle of Species Nutrition products. If you want to be your absolute best, join the evolution. Hey, this is the game Triple H from the WWE. You're watching RxMuscle.com, the truth in bodybuilding. RX Television, RxMuscle.com. This is Ask Dave Arnold, Classic Week Edition of Ask Dave. I'm your host, Sadiq Faruqi. Hope you are all well and hope you are all ready. For what's going to take place in Columbus, Ohio. We are going to be live from Columbus, Chris Aceto and I, uh, tomorrow to bring you all the coverage from Columbus, Ohio, and everything that's going to go on in and outside of the convention center, in and outside of the show, in the expo. Uh, and then, of course, Dave is going to have you covered with the in-studio uh, immediate reactions as soon as pre-judging ends, as soon as the finals recap, the finals end. Dave's going to go live. Dave, who are you going to have on that show, by the way? Did you, uh, do we uh, secure uh, King Kamali and anybody else? Yeah. yeah, I think it's going to be King Kamali, probably John Hansen, and uh, if Lee Priest is around, which he probably should be at night because um, that'll be his morning. We'll probably Perfect. get all three of those guys. So it should be it should be fun you know, to wrap things up with them. That's always, to be honest with you, um, and, and I think the fans would agree with this, uh, that's probably one of the more fun aspects of these big contest weekends. As soon as the show ends... Yeah. It's Dave, you know, it'll be John Romano, it'll be Lee, it'll be King Kamali. Uh, and, and I mean, it is just fun because I mean, you're getting an immediate reaction, but it's also a lot of ball busting. Uh, we right. have a lot of fun, obviously, we have the live, live, live audience as well. So, uh, good times all around. But again, uh, we're gonna have you covered wall to wall. If you haven't already done so, subscribe to our Instagram, uh, official underscore RX Muscle. If you're New to this channel, subscribe below, hit the notification bell so you're not going to miss anything that we upload during the course of the weekend. Um, you know, if we get any, you know, snapshot interviews with anyone, any notables that we run into, we'll be quick to upload. We, we won't put any fancy production. We'll just get it right up there. Uh, you know, have enough content that you'll be able to enjoy over the course of the weekend. Do, do you uh, remember, I, I just wanted to interject. You, you maybe remind me of something. Remember one year we covered the um, uh, Bob Goldman's Hall of Fame. Are, are you going, by the way, to Bob Goldman's? You are. Yeah, right? I, I, I will be there. I know uh, Half Thor Bjornsson will be there. He's going to be inducted. So hopefully Jackie we'll join her to too. Right, exactly. Yeah. Probably people don't even know who she is. She was like, <laughs> when, I was, when I was a runner, that was like, she was like, the greatest woman athlete of the era. I mean, she won the heptathlon like two times at the Olympics. She was amazing. But, yeah, it should be good. Bob always a guy has really, really good um, inductees, and he flies them in first class, you know, puts them up in the hotel. He, he takes good care of them, and so people like to come and do the, do the uh, event. And I, I think it's, you've got a good class you're going to be uh, interviewing them. But one year they had Jason Statham, you know, movie star. Yeah. Um, Extraordinaire. And I got to interview him because my good friend Fairfax Hackley, Hackley 
he runs the, um, the the security and procures all the athletes for Bob. He basically r- run, puts the whole show together for Bob. Yeah. And he, you know, he hooked me up and he gave, got me an interview with uh, Jason. And at the time, our video guy, Johnny, was uh, somehow – I, or I don't even know if it was Sal. It was whoever was working with someone videoed it and it and it got lost somehow and it got erased and I was so upset because it was like that's like a guy like I really he's like an actor I really enjoy his movies and I watch them all and uh, the Transporter and all the other you know the Expendables and everything he's done over the years he's just a cool actor and I was so upset and like I can't remember I think Johnny it's what it, someone found it like three or four years later and it did it did go up on our site but that that event always has top top quality uh stars athletes and so uh, don't they have a basketball player getting inducted this year too so no uh an nfl legend ronnie lott well ronnie lott right, right yeah right. ronnie lott and a four-time super bowl champion so yeah. it, it's going to be a lot of fun i mean it, obviously for our bodybuilding audience they'll be uh-huh. probably most familiar with half thor bjornson so we'll yeah. make him a priority to see if we can get him on camera after the induction ceremony but yeah if we get ronnie lot jack joiner kersey uh obviously you know again it, it, it's great because you know that event brings together um you know heroes from different sports you know sure. accomplished athletes so you know, but again, between that, between the expo interviews, obviously, um, the uh, meet the athletes interviews that we're going to do uh, tomorrow night, actually, um, you know, and anyone that we run into, just like the Olympia. I mean, basically, you will we'll be on high alert the entire weekend. Uh, you know, I'll have my cameraman Kaz with me the entire time. So anyone that we run into, anything that we encounter, I'll be sure to get it on our channel. And, uh, right. you know, again, like I said, subscribe, yeah. hit the notification bell. Jackie Joyner Kersey signed my sneakers. I probably told the story. I don't remember, but no, she signed my sneakers in 1984. Hmm. I think it was 83 or 84. No, 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 that's not right. 87 or 88, when I was in college, she appeared at a Kmart in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And I was a runner at the time. And, and oh, that's a throwback Kmart. Yeah, Kmart. They don't even have Kmart. <laughs> no, it's- and they uh, and she was signing pictures, and people didn't know what to do. And I just said, "Hey, uh, would you sign my sneakers, my running shoes?" And she signed my running shoes. So, but that was my uh, Jackie Joyner Kersey. So, so hopefully, we'll uh, be able to get Jackie Joyner yeah. Kersey on camera after the induction ceremony. Let's go to the questions. Loaded, loaded episode. Um, obviously, uh, well, here, we'll hold have- on. I'm going to give you. I'm going to give the bodybuilding connection now. So Jackie Joyner, her brother Al Joyner was married to Florence Griffith Joyner, who's, who passed um, since then. I don't know if something, she had something wrong, but she won or three or four gold medals at that 84 Olympics. And she wore these spandex tights. If people remember hot skins, they were like spandex. Tights, except one leg was was completely open and one leg was, was um, covered. And John Brown, the bodybuilder, you guys remember him. That's like Sean Ray, Melvin Anthony's like uh, – He's he was their like big influencer, taught them how to pose and all that stuff. Yeah. John Brown designed those tights for Jackie Joyner because she was in that whole Venice, California area there. And so they all uh they made their outfits for them. And all the Americans had the one leg thing, like and Jackie, of course, Florence Griffith winning the gold medals, you know, was like the the, the and she had these really long nails. If you remember, and she was the, the the poster child for that, and that was that was the the, the connection to bodybuilding, you know. <laughs> I, that is that is one wild, direct indirect yeah. tie-in, but there you yeah. have it. So hopefully we can ask her about that uh, yeah. this upcoming weekend. Uh, so get her about her brother. Sorry, you can ask her about her brother Al. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. First two questions on the show from the Dave Palumbo Experience app. Uh, First question, could you explain one more time how to know when a bodybuilder has been over-dieted? You know, it, it, I don't know about over-dieting, maybe under-feeding sometimes. If the person is like ready at four weeks out and they continue to diet, sometimes they get like, like a cachectic, like depleted look that instead of getting better and harder, they get worse. And what happens is because they're losing muscle and or too depleted, their skin gets loose. So because – and this has happened to me not where I've lost an enormous amount of muscle, but I over-dieted to the point where I no longer was looking better. I was looking worse. 
And it was because I was so depleted and I was in such a depleted state that my body was probably cannibalizing muscle tissue because I wasn't eating enough. Usually you can fix that in people. Like sometimes, you know, I'm dieting people, boom, 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 their metabolism takes off. It's going too fast. They get this, started getting this really depleted look. They're losing weight too fast. And then I say, okay, let's, let's put the brakes in this. We'll cut cardio. I'll give them more food. I'm going to give them a cheat meal like burger fries, up their carbs the next day to like maybe four or 500 grams, you know, and just load them up. And, just, and then what their body does is it does the reverse. It completely will turn around and like store and when I say store, I mean build muscle a lot of times and store glycogen. And within a week or two, you can actually turn a body's compl a physique completely around. And sometimes you get a nice rebound off that and, and a little anabolic effect. So I don't mind depleting people too much. You have to just be very on top of it. So if you, when you catch it, you can, then, you can then respond in the other direction. Sometimes people who don't have coaches looking at them, it starts happening to them and they, and they, and they just are in denial and they're like, I can do this. I can keep suffering even more because I want to get even harder. And they're getting worse and worse. And then, you know, sometimes they can, they can blow it, essentially. And that's why it's always good. Even if you don't have a coach you hire, it's good to have another eye looking at you on a regular basis to give you feedback, someone who you trust who's going to give you the truth. Second question again from the Dave Palumbo Experience app. Um, my HRT protocol allows for a year-long addition of up to 150 uh, mg deca weekly with my 200 mg test. What are the pros and cons of long-term low dose deca? You know, if you did 100 milligrams of deca and 100 milligrams of, of test every week, you'd probably get a nice little reaction from that. And you probably, your, your levels wouldn't be too high. When you start mixing like 200, 250 milligrams of test with another 150 milligrams a deck, and now you're kind of doing a low-grade anabolic cycle. There's really no toxicity from those because they're, they're long-acting drugs. And assuming your blood pressure is good, I mean, there's really no negative health benefits. I mean, you might plateau a little on your response to those drugs because you're constantly using them all the time. Uh, you know, you're going to probably get the red blood cell boosting effect, but you get that anyway from testosterone. I don't necessarily see any negatives to it, especially if like you have joint issues and the deca makes your joints feel really good. Um, but if you if you're starting to have like any kind of side effects, like maybe your creatinine is a little high because you're maybe your your blood pressures are running a little too too high. I mean that's something to consider. I I just I usually like if you're going to stay on like a like that kind of a dose, I kind of would like to bring it up and down, like maybe for you know, like you know maybe three months at the deca test, and then maybe bring it down to just testosterone for like you know, like, like maybe six to eight weeks and then go back up to that just because what's going to happen is you're, you're going to, you're not going to be responding after a while. So you're taking these drugs and you're not even getting good results from them anymore, aside from the, maybe the anti-inflammatory effect from the DECA. So, or you can just, like I said, if you, if you, if you want, just take a hundred milligrams of each every day, you know, forever. I mean, every day. I mean, once a week for continuously, I just think once you get into those higher dosages, you're kind of doing a cycle and you're getting a pharmacological muscle building you know, beyond what physiologically would be going on naturally in your body. So you're not just replacing what you produce, you're taking more than replacement. So there's a fine line between physiological levels and pharmacological, meaning drug-induced levels, and you get different side effects with these. And sometimes they're more subtle and you don't notice them, but if you're up here, you should come down here a little bit for a little bit of prayer and then go back up to here just so that you don't, like, once again, stagnate, number one, and number two, get any accumulative side effects. Let's go to our Instagram questions. Again, if you're not already following us on Instagram, the handle is official underscore RX muscle. Um, again, with this big weekend, we try to document everything that we can on our Instagram, on our feed, on our stories, um, and then, of course, everything else on YouTube. So if you're new to this channel, we ask that you subscribe below, hit the notification bell. Uh, if you like what you're watching, give us a like comment below and as always we appreciate all of your support and can't wait to bring you a wall-to-wall -wall coverage of the all classic this weekend let's go to Dwayne b doing a carnivore diet i hit a plateau in my weight loss should i have a cheat meal cheat meal like mcdonald's to reset my system you know carnivore diet is very similar to my ketogenic diet it's just there's no vegetables in it you know and it's all meats I, you know, to me, if you're going to do that diet, you might as well do my ketogenic diet because it's a lot healthier because there's a lot of essential fatty acids in there. There's better, you know, a better variety of protein sources. 
and there's some vegetables that even though they're you know low 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 glycemic vegetables but you can get in asparagus and green beans and some spinach possibly so you know but having said that whether you're doing my ketogenic diet or the carnivore diet you should have some carbs at least once a week just to spike your insulin levels and what does that do because you know your thyroid hormone is T4 essentially that's released from the thyroid gland. That's known as thyroxine. Thyroxine converts to T3. So T4 converts to T3 in your body, depending on how much your body needs. Your body will determine that and how much it converts. The T4 to T3 conversion, however, is dependent on the fact that there's insulin present. So when insulin levels are low, your body will downregulate how much T4 converts to T3. It's just, just a fact. When insulin levels are higher, it converts more T4 to T3 because the body is smart. It uses that the it uses carbohydrate intake and insulin levels to determine whether the nutritional state of the body is good or it's deprived. Even though you might be eating enough calories with a ketogenic diet, you, if you're not eating enough carbs, it could slow your thyroid down, your thyroid conversion at least. By having a cheat meal once a week or, or a carb meal at least and spiking your insulin at that meal, it basically tricks your body to think, oh, everything's cool. You know, We thought something was going on, but now we know. Look at these high insulin levels here. Everything's cool. Keep converting T4 to T3. Now, sometimes there's, there's an overriding effect of this because when you take growth hormone, growth hormone makes your body convert more T4 to T3. So sometimes if you go for blood work with, when you're on growth hormone, you'll notice you have high T3 levels or high normal sometimes, and then your T4 levels are a little on the lower side. And people think sometimes doctors don't understand this. They're like, oh, your thyroid gland isn't producing enough T4. Well, it is. I mean, T, yeah, it is. It's just you're converting more to T3 because of GH. So that's why, you know, that's one of growth hormones' indirect fat burning effects on the body. Now, qu these are great questions. And questions like this are really very common on my Dave Palumbo Experience app. And I don't know, I, I answered some questions from in the beginning, but, you know, one of the things you get for $29 a month, if you download my app from your iTunes store or your uh, Android store, is you get to ask me unlimited questions. And I answer them in an open forum on the app so everyone sees everyone's questions, everyone's answers. All my writings, all my videos are in one place. We put up a workout every week and they do an exclusive Q&A video session, just like we're doing here. Like as they, it's an extra one. We only give to the app members. And so you're constantly learning. It's a learning experience. It goes coincides with my Palumbo University um, guru course, and we'll be launching more courses in the future, how to read food labels, anabolic steroid course, because I believe in educating people. But this little app is great because it's cheap. It's something that on a regular basis, you're getting content to upgrade your information that you, learn, that you're, you want to learn about. The more you hear these questions and answers, and the more you review the material, the better you're going to get at not only helping yourself, but if you want to coach other people, being a great coach too. Uh, let's go to Bilal Hamide. For someone who plays high intensity sport like soccer regularly once a week, would this have a negative impact on leg gains in the gym and coming across? I mean, the injuries is a different aspect, but we do get this question fairly often as far as, you know, partaking in high intensity activities. I mean, he mentioned soccer specifically, but we yeah. do get questions often about, you know, whether or not high intensity is going to affect, um, you know, overall muscle gains. But, I mean, he specifically mm -hmm. mentions legs. Yeah. You're not going to want to hear the answer to my question, whoever answers this, because um, the answer is if you want to be a great bodybuilder and you want to be the best bodybuilder you can be, I'm not talking about being a guy who just has a good physique. I'm talking about someone who competes. You shouldn't play any other sports. Because when we train in the gym, when we squat – and we leg press and we leg curl and we leg extension. We're only training our legs in, in, in this, this, this motion, one dimension, okay? We're not doing anything lateral side to side. Soccer, football, baseball requires lateral, quick lateral movements, okay? And because we're so overdeveloped in one plane of movement, which is backwards forwards, we're very prone to injury. Okay, so number one, playing soccer once a week, while it sounds innocuous because it's once a week, and you know, um, how much energy can I expend for an hour once a week? That's not the problem. The problem is that you're going to risk getting injured and that you're not going to be able to train the way you need to in the gym. There was a great bodybuilder in, from Brooklyn, Sammy Abdul. 
lot of people in the New York area know him. Great, great potential. This guy won the Eastern USA. He was a good friend of mine. Um, and we used to hang out like every week. We'd see each other, eat some lunch or whatever, or eat dinner. And this guy, I, I, I mean, I was big at the time. I was 300 pounds, but he had shape, structure, man. He was thick. He was like a little Nasser El somebody. Matter of fact, he was friends with Nasser. And I thought he was going to go all the way, you know, right to the Olympia stage. And he, after he won the Eastern USA, he went on a vacation with his family. He was playing beach volleyball. He reached up to slam a ball, tore something in the shoulder, end of career. Um, it's not worth it. If you're, if you're going to be a great bodybuilder, if that's your goal, you don't play any other sports. I know it sucks, but you just can't do it. You can't go skiing. You can't do stuff that requires your body to have to adjust laterally side to side and make quick, weird movements because you will tear something and you will hurt yourself. It's not a matter of if, it's just when. So if soccer is that important to you, then bodybuilding obviously is not your number one priority. You're fine. You can do it. You're not going to probably lose any muscle from doing it, but the risk of injury is very high. But Dave, let me ask you this, Ben, and I think this may have been part of his question. Because Again, we do get this question a lot. So, okay, take take a sport out of it, but just in terms yeah. of general high-intensity training, right? We do get bodybuilders to talk yeah. about, you know, during prep, like they'll do sprints. They'll do like you know, explosive movements. You know, yeah. how would you factor that into them negatively impacting their gains? Once again, sprints, risk of injury. I don't see it as – I don't think you're going to lose muscle from it. I think it's risk of injury is, is okay. really what it, what it amounts to. What, in other words, if you don't have to sprint on stage – why would you do sprints? You know what I mean? Like I, I even the girls that do it, I, I just, they run bleachers. Like, I mean, you're not getting good glutes from running bleachers. Do, do lunges in the gym. Think about it. Bodybuilding is about controlled movements, not fast ballistic type stuff. Cause that's how you get hurt. There's, you're not going to burn calories on your butt because you're running bleachers. Okay. <laughs> Just like if you get on a stairmaster and you squeeze your butt every every step that you take, you're not building any muscle back there. It's delusional. You might build mind muscle connection, nerve connections there. Yeah. But you're not you you cannot spot reduce fat. We know that for a fact. And number one, you don't build muscle from from walking steps. You build muscle from short bursts of activity, squatting, eight to ten reps, leg pressing, lunges. Smith machine squat. That's how you build mass. We know that because, you know, there's not a million. You see people see sprinters and they see, oh, look how big their legs are. Those guys squat in the gym. That's why their legs are so big. It's not because they were sprinting on the track. If they didn't do, if they didn't, if they didn't do crazy, you know, leg, press, leg presses and, and squats and lunges, they wouldn't have the size legs that they do. And, and most of those guys are on, on steroids, unfortunately. You know, I hate to break it to you. So if you're going to be a bodybuilder, stick with bodybuilding movements. I always, people always come to me and say, uh, don't I need to do high intensity activity, uh, extra uh, aerobics to lose weight? I'm like, they're not asking you to run a marathon on stage. They just want you to be lean. If your goal is to get ripped, do lower intensity, longer duration cardio so that you ensure you're only using fat as a fuel source. You know, people just don't want to hear it. You know, they, they think that they uh, they can run they can run off the weight. You know, and that's not the case. Let's go to Ivan Bandinets. Thoughts on taurine? Uh, I saw Dorian Yates said he always included it in his pre workout supplement stack, and then of course, uh, very prominent in in more or less every energy drink you're going to find on the market. Oh boy, oh boy, the total taurine thing. Yeah, uh, doesn't do anything. <laughs> 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 say does it hurt no but it doesn't really do very much i've researched it i, I actually researched it. i was gonna i actually think i did a rant on it uh, maybe a couple of years ago about why tour you know just why certain ingredients are in certain products and how they don't really do anything but people put them in there by convention because like one person put taurine in an energy drink so everyone does it because they think that's what has to be in there but no one really knows what it does they just know hey it's cheap enough Throw it in there just so that people don't think it's missing, you know. But come on, what does it do? If you don't put the taurine in that in that Red Bull or that uh, that you know Rockstar Energy drink you're drinking or Bang, it's going to do exactly the same thing <laughs> without the taurine. So it doesn't prevent you know anything. So sorry to break it to you, uh, Andrew Wilcox. You know we do often 
you know, given your authority with the ketogenic diet, talk about different different aspects of it. You know, this question, I'm glad it was asked because I think for, uh, I don't want to say mainstream society, the, the non-bodybuilding society, to many, their introduction to ketogenic diet was, um, you know, as a discussion on the, I guess, say that it could help with epilepsy. So the question is, uh, it was from Andrew Wilcox, my son was recently diagnosed with epilepsy. Can the ketogenic diet help with this disorder? I've heard this works from sources, but I can't seem to understand the mechanism. Do you have any clinical experience with this? Yeah, I, I had a client who was uh, had who had seizure disorders, and she said when she was when I would diet her for shows and she was off carbs, she never had a seizure ever. It's something with the glucose. You know, when you're eating a lot of glucose and the brain is using glucose, if you have a seizure issue, whether it be epilepsy or other seizure disorders, it makes you more prone to them. Uh, when you take away glucose, you don't have seizures. And that's why they've always used medical ketogenic diets, you know, to prevent people who have seizure disorders from having them. Now, the medical ketogenic diet is different than what I advocate. Medical ketogenic diet is high fat, moderate protein, low carbs. I advocate high protein. I'm the only person, ketogenically speaking, you know, that, that does high protein, moderate fat because bodybuilders break down an enormous amount of muscle. See, the medical community always says you can't eat high protein because your body will convert that extra protein that you're eating into glucose, which your brain will use as fuel and you'll never go into ketosis, which is accurate if you're not working out and, and you don't have a high protein need. But if you're in the gym and you're breaking down tons of muscle tissue, which we do as bodybuilders, our protein requirement is much higher. So we need to take more protein in or we don't repair muscle. And the fat, obviously, in a moderate consumption will be enough to fuel the, you know, your workouts in your daily life. And that's what you want to do with it. The reason why they get more fat in the ketogenic diet is because if you eat extra fat, most of it just gets burned up for energy. Okay. It's the, the carb, it's the protein they're worried about turning into carbs. Not the case with athletes. Stone Cold Steve Austin, WWE wrestler, he contacted me and he had the same problem. He's like, I don't understand why my ketogenic diet doesn't work. I'm doing, you got Triple H on a ketogenic diet. It looks great. I said, why? And I said, what are you doing? And he told me high fat, you know, it was actually low protein he was eating. I said, you work out at the gym five days a week. Why, why aren't you eating high protein? He goes, oh, I don't want to go into, I don't want to screw up the ketosis. I said, I said, <laughs> I said, Stone Cold. You need extra protein because you're training so hard. So he, I started work. I did a 12 week diet with him, and I put him on a, my higher protein, moderate fat. He gained like 15 pounds because he probably had lost muscle, and he lost, you know, probably 20 pounds of fat. So, and he looked great, and he loved it. And he actually had me on his podcast. We talked about that and the nuances of that. You have to understand athlete versus couch potato. Both Kate, both people want to lose weight and or control, you know. Uh, seizure disorder, but they got to go about it in a different way because of the protein requirements. Let's go to Mark Andrews. Do your taste buds actually change during prep? As we know, chaining a vegetable uh, deep into a diet can taste like a new dessert. Is this a psychological phenomenon or do our bodies actually change our taste receptors? Yeah, I think taste receptors, I've noticed this when I was dying. I think they become more... Um, more precise they become more keen they can pick up flavor nuances better because what happens is when your body is hungry and starving for nutrition because you're burning up so much body fat your body wants to entice you to eat more so smells things smell better things you could taste things much better i remember i could eat a plain piece of like cod okay when i'm dieting with nothing on it and it will taste like like a filet mignon. I mean, it's it's so tasty. And then after the, the contest is over, I'll try to eat that same piece of cod, and I can, it's like I almost can't even get it down because it has no taste whatsoever. Same thing. I would drink like like protein shakes, like when I was dieting. You know, I would blend them up with water and ice, and literally, I mean, there's like no carbs in them. I mean, literally, I, I thought I was drinking like a chocolate milkshake. I mean, everything just tastes way better, and that's why everyone, when, as they're dieting, are making lists in their head of what I'm going to eat first. I'm going to eat this. I'm going to eat that. I'm going to eat this dessert. Blah, blah, blah. And then what happens is the, sh the show's over. You have you eat a couple, like you devour a few meals like the first day or two. And then you, you, you're, you're nauseous almost. And then you don't even care about eating anymore. It's almost like, oh, enough is enough. So 100% 
the body must have some sort of evolutionary you know mechanism that as we become lower in body fat and food becomes scarce food tastes better so that we can entice ourselves to eat more Ahmed Akinchi, Los Angeles. Can chicken, can eating chicken cause a spike in estrogen levels in our bodies or is it a myth? You know, maybe chicken McNuggets. Because <laughs> who knows what they put in those. They taste damn good though. My kids get them all the time. I can't stop eating them. But, you know, are there, are there estrogens in everything right now? Nowadays, it seems like there are. Like meats and... because. A lot of times they give hormones to the cows so that they eat more and get fatter so they have a better yield of, of you know beef. So I wouldn't be surprised if like McDonald's hamburgers, you know, had higher estrogenic, you know, compounds in them. Now, is it enough to influence our bodies? Maybe, maybe not. You know, they're saying that women are going through pu uh, puberty and, and the girls are menstruating at a much younger age nowadays, and they're blaming all the you know, the stuff in the, from plastics in the, in the foods and the, the estrogens and phytoestrogens in the foods. Is it true? Who knows? I don't know. It might be. But I think what your question as a bodybuilder is, is it going to cause estrogenic side effects in me? Like I'm going to get like gynecomastia or fluid retention? I don't think so. I don't think the levels are high enough for that. Um, we're talking about, you know, small physiological possible levels that could, you know, sway a girl into turning her into, you know, uh, to getting her to go through puberty a little earlier or something like that. Maybe in boys that are prone, maybe some guy to come ask it. I don't even, th I don't even think it would do that to be honest with you. I don't think there's enough, but I guess it also depends on how much you consume and what the source of it is. So is it possible? Yes. Is it, you know, likely that you're probably getting side effects from that? Probably not. Um, Delibrio or Bitrio. My coach has given me the choice to take either Mastron or Primo alongside test. Is Primo worth the expensive price? And what are the benefits of taking Primo versus Mastron? Well, you know, if you have to pick one or the other, you know, Mastron is much stronger than Primo Bone. So if I had to pick one or the other and not both, I would take Mastron every day, 100 milligrams every other day, at least. Primo Bone is pretty weak. You know, it's weaker. It's about the same strength as Winstrel. It's, you know, it's certainly not as strong as, as, as Masteron. And most of the Prima volume on the market, and I've said this a gazillion times now, is, is, is fake. You know, it's test propionate. They're not putting real Prima volume into things. Now, if you had access to real Prima volume, if you bought the Roy test kits on my Dave Palumbo website and you tested it and it was real, you know, you can use it. it but I think people have built Prima Bowen up to be this mythical drug because of the fact that it is not that readily available. It is really expensive. And most of the stuff is fake. So people think when they find a real source of it, they'll pay any amount of money because they think, well, it must be great if it's not available, right? Supply, it's the law of supply and demand. Adam Smith, you take that economics 101. You know, when the supply is low, the demand is high and the price is high. That's just the way it goes. You know, you, you could sh look, you could short the market on anything. If I, if tomorrow they, the Chinese said, you know what, we're not selling any Trembolone to these Americans for the next six months. The prices of Trembolone acetate would go through the freaking roof and everyone would want to be on that. So everyone was, I got to get that. I'll spend a thousand dollars on a bottle if I can get Trembolone because supply and demand. When the demand, when the supply is high and the demand is, is no longer that high because everyone has a bottle of the stuff. No one wants to pay anything for it. You, yeah, you can't give this stuff away practically. That's the way the market works. And it's funny because Prima Bone was never a very desirable drug. People were never like killing themselves for, for Prima Bone. Maybe Anivar because women love Anivar because it doesn't have side effects. But not never Prima Bone. But as soon as Prima Bone got shorted and the price went up and it became the most counterfeited drug out there, everyone wanted it. And then it got this cult following where everyone's like, you got any Primo? I got to get Primo because it's not available. It, it Don't waste your time. To me, Winstrel and Primo Bowen are comparable to each other in terms of effects. Two, three more questions. Uh, Endomorph Boy, do you think Parabolin is capable of being reproduced today via underground labs? From what, what I remember, it's a very expensive chemical to produce. Also, how effective do you think this ester is versus the other readily available trend esters? 
Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. You know, I think a lot of people um, see Parabon as also the same the way they see the Prima Bone because it's not available. You know, Parabon was actually made in France. I actually bought it in pharmacies in Andorra. Andorra is like a little municipality that's like right halfway between France and Spain. You got to go through this long tunnel in Barcelona and you get to Andorra. But you can buy you can buy both French and Spanish anabolics there. So I actually have personally purchased Parabon from a pharmacy several times in Andorra, <laughs> and and it was still expensive. It was like nine bucks an ampule, which is expensive pharmacy price. But they knew that they knew that the bodybuilders really liked this stuff, and a lot of bodybuilders went there. But we we got a bunch of it, and it's Trenbolone Hex Hexalate Hex Hexalate or Heptalate or something like that or Hexal something or another. It's it's a long acting ester of, of trenbolone, kind of similar to tren and anthate. So it's not like tren acetate, which is super fast acting. So if you have access to tren and anthate, it's pretty much the same thing. Usually I tell guys to use tren and anthate in the off season and tren acetate pre contest because tren acetate makes you way nuttier and it makes it, it jacks your blood pressure up and your, it makes it harder to sleep. It it has a lot more side effects than the, than the long acting trend, that, which is still gets you a little aggravated, but it's it's not so bad. So off season, you don't want to have trouble sleeping, and it's not worth it. You can deal with that pre contest because trend acetate cosmetically makes the body look a little better because it rapidly works much faster. So that's how I always like to divide it up. But when I was competing in the nineties, because trend alone acetate didn't come around in. in around the 2000s but in the early 90s mid 90s when we used parabone we used a pre-contest and we used it off season and it worked great so both will work you can use trend and anthate in place of trend acetate if trend acetate gives you too many side effects but i wouldn't go out of my way and spend a fortune on parabone just to say oh i have parabone because you're not getting real parabone anyway you're just getting the compound that was in parabone which is the um, trend hex so once again it's more of a hype thing because it's not available anymore. And that's the way it works with drugs. When things disappear, I'm surprised people aren't hunting down methangyl dipropanate. Methangyl dipropanate was always the, the steroid that they said, cleaned your receptors. It makes things work better. It enhances the other drugs by making your, creating more androgen receptors. Whether it did that or not, I don't know. But, but we got a hold of some of those bottles back in the day and then, when I took it, I sure felt good on it, but who knows if it really did it or anything or not. But guaranteed, now that I just mentioned that, people will start looking for that drug, and that will be something that's in demand. There's a lot of those drugs like that, and that's what just happens. Things go in and out of style, but at the end, end of the day, there's always things that can be used to replace it. Trend and anthate is more than a replacement for parable. Another question from uh, the same uh, viewer, Endomorph Boy. Several years ago, Bill Llewellyn put his legacy, his words, not mine, on the line with the theory of uh, ARA, ARA uh, arachidonic acid supplementation for muscle growth, his X Factor product. Since then, I've heard very little about this theory, nor do I know anyone who has tried it. My questions are one, do you believe in the theory? Two, uh, do you know anyone that has successfully supplemented with ARA for muscle growth? Yeah, I, I've used it. I, I actually sell his uh, X Factor on my DavePalumbo.com website. Um, I sell a lot of it, actually. It's a racket, you know, when we talk about essential fatty acids, we have two families. We have the omega-3s, which is, you know, DHA, EPA. Those are the two intermediates that actually are functional. And then we have the omega-6, you know, uh, linoleic acid, parent compound that gets converted to the usable form, which is arachidonic acid and GLA. GLA is what you find in primrose oil, barrage oil. That's what I put in my, in my excuse me, my, my omegalyze formula. It's a very hard to find anti-inflammatory omega-6 fat. Hard to get from the diet, good to take supplementally. Arachidonic acid you do get in the diet a lot because if you eat chicken or red meat or egg whole eggs, it has some arachidonic in there. But it's he sells a concentrated uh, form of arachidonic. So it's like a, it's like a thousand milligrams or a gram of, of arachidonic acid in one pill. And you know, you take it after you train because when you train, the arachidonic acid is, is in physiologically in the body gets released from the membranes of the muscle cells when they get broken down. It, that's a precursor to an inflammatory prostaglandin. So prostaglandins are local acting hormones. When these prostaglandins are released, these specific ones that come from the arachidonic acid precursor, they incite inflammation. 
Now, chronic inflammation in the body, throughout the body, is not good. We know that for the body. But local inflammation where the injury occurred, in other words, where you broke down the muscle, is good because it's a signal for the body to come in there and start repairing. And one of the repair, you know, or fatty acids that the body needs to use is arachidonic acid. So by providing extra arachidonic acid, the body can repair itself better and have a more of a signal to, 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 to target that area for repair. Now, what people notice when they take this arachidonic acid product is that they get sore. They get more sore uh, and they get more inflamed in the area. Why? Because that's what arachidonic acid's job is. So when it gets intercalated into, when you load your muscle cell membranes up with arachidonic acid and then you damage that cell membrane because you're training biceps or whatever in the gym, you're going to get more of an inflammatory response than you got before, which is good because now your body can signal to repair. Does it work? Yes. He did research. There's, there's definitely you know, theoretical research. The problem is sometimes that a lot of people are not deficient in arachidonic acid. So yes, they take the supplement and they get a little boost from it, but they don't notice it quite as much. They definitely feel more sore. I, I absolutely felt more sore when I, when I took it. Um, and I'll cycle it on and off. The good thing, it really doesn't have a systemic effect. So you don't have to worry about, oh, I'm going to boost my, my inflammatory markers in my body up. It's not going to happen from taking the supplement. You're just giving your body the raw materials uh, to, to create this inflammatory prostaglandin that's going to help with muscle cell repair. And I think it's a brilliant supplement because I never even thought that to put out a version of it. And I didn't think that maybe taking in more of it would help. But when I read his research and the papers and all the experiments they did on it, it really did show that people built more muscle on this stuff. So it, there's definitely some science behind it. Once again, it, it's kind of what I call a luxury in, a product. It's not the first supplement you should be taking. You should be taking a product like Omegalyze first, which is your essential fatty acids that you can't easily get from the diet. Okay. Um, a good example is the, a lot of people will find that when I know Jay Cutler was a big advocate of this. If they ate red, more red meat, they grew better. And that's because red meat has a lot of arachidonic acid in there. Why? Because they feed the cows corn. Corn causes inflammatory prostaglandins and, and arachidonic acid to be accumulated in the meats of the animals. And then we eat the meat and we get all that, that stuff. Now, with grass-fed beef, the cows only eat grass. They don't produce as much arachidonic acid. They produce more anti-inflammatory omega-3 fatty acids like EPA and DHA. That doesn't mean you're not going to grow from that meat because it's still a good protein source. It just means you're not going to have as much inflammation in your body. Um, so for people who are prone to heart disease, you don't want to be taking in massive amounts of, of arachidonic acid. A supplemental form is not going to cause any problems, but you don't want massive amounts. That's why I always tell people, you know, red meat and, you know, you know, saturated fats are not going to cause you to have, you know, clogged arteries, but it's going to cause a lot of inflammation in the body, which is not good. So everything's about balance. It's balancing, knowing what your genetics are, knowing what your deficiencies are. If you're a guy who doesn't eat any fat in your diet, this might be a great, or, or you just eat fish and no red meat or chicken, this product is probably something you should take. If you eat chicken, if you eat chicken and you eat um, red meat on a regular basis, you might not notice quite as much. That's going to do for this episode of Ask Dave. Again, this weekend, Arnold Classic, we're going to have you covered from the site of the 2023 Arnold Classic as well as Dave in studio. As soon as the night show ends, as soon as prejudging ends, um, and of course, the finals on Saturday night, uh, Dave will be going live with the immediate reaction. So again, subscribe below, hit the notification bell, so you'll know as soon as those live events go up, um, or anything that we post to you, to our YouTube channel uh, during the course of the Arnold Classic weekend. You'll be the first to know. Subscribe below. Hit the notification bell. Again, if you like what you're watching, hit the like button, comment below. And again, we appreciate all of your support and can't wait to deliver the best coverage of the 2023 Arnold Classic. For Dave Palumbo, I'm Sadiq Faruqi. We'll see you from Columbus.